You just heard this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 begins the Sermon on the Mount. And it says, Seeing the crowds, he, meaning Jesus, went up on the mountain. When he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them. So my first question, who is the Sermon on the Mount for? The disciples. Maybe. At the very end, there's 111 verses of this Sermon on the Mount. Jesus just now delivered some of the most important words that he ever shared with humanity. He's talked about the Lord's Prayer, how to love your enemies. He's talked about how you and I cannot be anxious, the golden rule. And then in chapter 7, verse 28, at the end, when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished. The crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them not He was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. So again, I ask, who is the Sermon on the Mount for? And now it seems like it was the the crowd. The, The answer is that Jesus did deliver this sermon for his disciples. They came and were close. But the entire time, Jesus knew that all around him on this mountain, listening, watching, would be crowds of people, perhaps many who were not yet disciples, And he shared all this with them in mind, but to his disciples. This morning, this message and this time together as we go through Jesus' sermon is for the disciples of Jesus. But if you find yourself not yet one of those, you are so welcome here. You are so welcome to be an onlooker, to be able to listen. And our prayer is just like with Jesus' sermon, that in light of what Jesus says, you would be astonished by what Jesus has to say. Welcome to Two Rivers. My name's Nick, it's great to see you today. I'm so glad that you've come to church. Uh, My wife and I have been coming here a few years. We've been members for a few years. I serve on the elder team and it is a joy to be a part of this church family with you guys. I wanna ask you a quick question. Um, If you have ever had one of those moments where you know logically what's in front of you but you come to the wrong conclusion even though it should be obvious. I asked Meredith this yesterday, my wife, and just said, give me an example of a time when this happens in your life. And she said one that um, didn't resonate as much with me, but maybe does with some of you. She was talking about how sometimes we invite people over, like a group, last second. Hey, right after church, you guys wanna come over? And she thinks to herself, well, instead of cooking, it'll be really easy, let's just do a charcuterie board. And then like $100 at Publix later, and hours of slicing and preparing everything, come to the conclusion, even though I've done this before, this is not easier. I think it's easier, but it's not. Does that land for any of you? Does that seem like something you've experienced? I don't know. For, for me, one that's embarrassing that happens to me frequently, my wife and my daughter are both voices of reason in my life. Um, Meredith and Summer have on many occasions looked at me and said, Dad or Nick, don't just put it in your mouth. That came right out of the oven. It's hot. And I've seen it. I've heard what they say. I've been burnt many times, and consistently, out of just a hunger for what's in front of me, I just pop in my mouth, and I say, ow, and it happens over and over, and I'm ashamed to tell you this. Uh, This happens with sports fans all the time, Cowboys fans, they come in on a Sunday morning, and they start saying, hey, this is the week the NFL starts, and this is our year, and you know it's not, right? Like, (laughs) you guys know it isn't, we know it isn't. Um, One that resonates with me, I uh, find my heart really, like, somber, for people, this happens for men and women of all ages, but there's something unique about young men and young women who can stand in front of a mirror, and a doctor would be able to look at this young boy or young girl and say, like, you are so healthy, your BMI is everything great, and this young boy or young girl can look in a mirror and see themselves so wrongly, and it's destructive, isn't it? when they start looking at who they are and seeing something that isn't real in front of them, drawing the wrong conclusion. I bring this up because it is possible that you come into the Beatitudes today that we're about to read and do what I have been doing as I've been trying to figure out this text, where I start coming to wrong conclusions with what's right in front of me. I'll talk about that in a second. Let me tell you about Matthew real fast. So Matthew is a book written by Matthew. He's one of Jesus' disciples. He was a tax collector. I really love the book of Matthew. I like the way Matthew writes. He is a precise writer. He's really thoughtful. He uses structure really intentionally. So uh, Matthew is writing to a primarily Jewish audience, 
And he's got this theme throughout Matthew where he wants people to know that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. He didn't come, this is just like 10 verses later from where we are today. He didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. That's why Matthew says stuff all the time. This might not land on you, but it would to his hearers at the time. Matthew keeps saying things like, now Jesus did all this to fulfill what was written back in the Old Testament. He wants the Jewish people to know this is your king. So he uses structure to make that really clear. I'll give you a couple examples of these sandwiches that Matthew writes with. So where we are today in Matthew 5 through 7, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, is sandwiched, where before it and after it, we start seeing these incredible moments of the miracles of Jesus. And then his teaching is the meat inside of the sandwich. I share this as a quick application to you because maybe this resonates for you. Um, If you and I look at the words of Jesus, the teaching, and we say, oh, that is good teaching for me. I need all of this ethical code and all the good stuff Jesus has for me, but I don't really believe that he's gonna come and transform me and work miracles and do all the things. So I kind of shy away from any of that supernatural stuff. We are understanding Jesus incorrectly. That's not how this sandwich was made, or vice versa. If you and I, this is my temptation pretty often, if we wanna only look at this part of Jesus and say, oh man, I need him, he's my helper, he's gonna work a miracle, God help me with that test, or whatever it is in front of us, and we ask for him to come be a miracle worker, but we wanna ignore all of his teaching, we are incorrectly understanding Jesus. Does that make sense? Matthew does this kind of structure throughout. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you, I personally, emotionally, like I am in the sweetest like, moment of the year where football season is here and now, and I just feel so good. I don't know if you feel that way. I feel really good. But I also long all year long for Christmas. And so today, we're gonna stop, talk about Christmas really fast. You ready for this? Um, in Matthew chapter one, the very beginning of the New Testament, Matthew mentions the name of Jesus at the beginning. He says this is the genealogy of Jesus a couple times. And the first time he ever speaks about the name of Jesus, look at this in Matthew chapter one, verse 20 and 21. An angel of the Lord appears to Joseph, the father of Jesus, in a dream and says, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She'll bear a son You shall call his name Jesus. Is he about to say, Emmanuel, God with us? Matthew says, you shall call him Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. Matthew writes this, and at the beginning of the book, he wants you to know Jesus is the one who saves you from sins. At the very end of the book, he's gonna spend eight chapters just on the final week of Jesus' life, whenever Jesus is fulfilling what it takes to be able to save you from your sins. All of the week leading up to the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus, he writes all of this so that you and I see Matthew, in Matthew, who Jesus is, he came to save you from your sins. So here in the middle, in the meat, when we look at this sermon, let me give you an example of how you can slap Jesus in the face the way I sometimes do. If we read this text right here and we say, I'm gonna look at these Beatitudes because I'm ready for me to find a way for me to save myself if I do things better, you are missing the heart of Jesus and missing the point of Matthew. Jesus came to be able to save you from your sins. Do not, that is my word of caution this morning, do not read what we are about to look at and think here's a new laundry list of ways I can go save myself. If you do, you will be missing what is right in front of you in the mirror. Does that make sense? I hope you have a Bible. If you do, I hope you bring it. I actually forgot my Bible this morning and I'm borrowing Maggie's. Thanks, Maggie. Um, I'm gonna ask you guys, uh, before we look at this text, would you mind not listening to me pray, but instead, would you agree with me in prayer? Would you pray with me? I, I I would really appreciate that if you guys would join me. Let's pray and just ask for help. God, we need you right now. Without you today, these are just words, and they are not the words of life in me. If you don't come and make this real and alive in me, this won't be the life that you have for me. And so, God, I ask that you would come to me and to my friends and make your word illuminated so that it changes me and transforms me. I need your help, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me tell you what we're going to do, if you like knowing the syllabus 
because um, I do. Uh, we're going we're gonna to look verse by verse, Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to do the first three Beatitudes. So we're going to go verse 1 through 5, verse by verse, kind of quickly. And then I'm going to have one main point that sort of has to do with the space-time continuum. And then we're going to talk about like, what that means for our life today. Okay, that's the, that's the plan. For those of you who aren't disciples of Jesus yet, you just need to remember that there are some astonishing and beautiful things that Jesus is speaking about. And I hope you listen, because you're just so welcome. For followers of Christ... Jesus asks you to draw near so he can say this to you. Please listen closely. Chapter five, verse one. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain. When he sat down, his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and he taught them and he said the first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I wanna talk about just this verse really quick. There are a few key phrases in here. The first one is the word blessed or blessed. It's not one that you probably say like that. You probably don't start too many sentences with blessed. And this word right here to translate is really important that we get right. Um, There are times when people would try to translate this word as happy, and that may have in the past been a really good translation, but English has changed a lot. Um, I don't know if you guys like language the way I like language, but English changes, and so happy now to you and to me probably is a much more emotional word that fleets in and out. Does that seem true to you? Like happiness kind of is here and is gone, is a real emotional thing? That is not what this word means. Blessed is a state of how you would be flourishing, maybe even better put, blessed is those who are fortunate. God has favored you in this way. God has favored you you who are poor in spirit, because he's been doing something. God is favoring you. That's what blessed means that I would, I would recommend that you kind of think of as the word. You're so fortunate if this is what God is doing. Blessed are the poor in spirit. It's another expression I just really doubt you're using in your conversations normally. The poor in spirit, I think we know that first word poor, and we know what that means, and it's probably the key word to hone in on. Like poor in spirit would be for us who are able to rightly see ourselves and say, there is a poverty in me. There is a spiritual bankruptcy in me. Apart from God, I am poor and empty. I am a beggar with nothing in front of me. Uh, Somebody who is poor in spirit is gonna say, I am powerless without his strength. Somebody who's poor in spirit is gonna be able to say, I'm unworthy without his son's worthiness being credited to me. They're gonna be saying, I am incapable of joy apart from God and his grace giving me joy. Does this make sense to you? So poor in spirit is gonna happen whenever you and I see ourselves more rightly. There's amazing heroes of the faith in the Old Testament who live this out. I think of David, I think of Moses, I think of Jacob. Maybe Abraham would be one good for you to think about. Abraham in Genesis 18 speaks of one who is poor in spirit. In in Genesis 18, Abraham says, I will speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Somebody who's poor in spirit is not low self-esteem. This doesn't mean you're constantly just beating yourself up, I'm the worst all the time. That's not what it means. Poor in spirit is one who is seeing God, being drawn to God and in light of who he is, you look at yourself and you see, oh, that is life, I am death. There is deadness inside of me. I need this life that God has for me. Does this make sense? Blessed are the poor in spirit who who see themselves rightly, for theirs right now is, it says, the kingdom of heaven. We go to the next verse because I think Jesus connects this in a way that you and I may really need. I, I know I do and I'll tell you why. He next says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I don't know about you. I want to kind of confess to you the whole beatitude section. There is such a spectrum for me of whether or not I'm anywhere in this, in this conversation. There are times when I am just so not poor in spirit, and I am not thinking about my depravity. I'm thinking I'm in a really good spot. But there are times where I am fortunate. God is favoring me by letting me be able to see, Nick, there is a lot of death and ugliness and brokenness in you. And then do you know what I can do? I can be cold to this. Does that expression make sense to you? Not if that, I don't know if it does. My my wife yesterday said, no, maybe that expression doesn't make sense for people. For me, what that can mean is I can acknowledge something isn't right in me and then I can just move on and in a cold manner, I can, I can acknowledge it here, but it doesn't affect me. 
that there is something really wrong and broken. Does that make sense? Blessed are those, perhaps Jesus connecting these, saying, blessed are those, the poor in spirit who mourn. For a Jewish hearer at the time, it would be something both personal and maybe communal, maybe something we would see in all of us. I wonder if any of this is in you. Do you have this in yourself? Blessed are those who they see what is broken and not right. Something is not how it should be between me and God, and it causes your heart to break and you're mourning for it, or perhaps it's with your eyes, like the Jewish people who know of this godly remnant of God's people who are going to be able to see Jesus rightly, even though so many people did not. That would cause them to mourn that God's people are missing Jesus in front of them. Or for you, like when you see the church, the big C, capital C church, Do you look around and you see what the state of maybe how God is working and and maybe at times you see the brokenness in in our in in the bride? Does it cause your heart to mourn? Or or whenever you are able to just look at the globe around you and see this state of brokenness, does it cause your heart to mourn? How fortunate are you? How favored are you if God is taking your heart and allowing you to see the brokenness, the spiritual poverty and bankruptcy? And it causes you to mourn. If you've been to a funeral, and if you're a follower of Jesus, you know the difference between those who grieve with and without hope, don't you? Haven't you experienced it and contemplated just like, you can't get past this kind of hurt without Jesus? Some of you have had that thought, perhaps even recently. If you and I want to pick and choose this kingdom of heaven, we would be incorrect in thinking that the Christian life and the Christian walk It's just joy every day, only gladness, and there is never a time for tears. That is not what the kingdom of heaven for you and for me often means. Oftentimes for you and for me, it means rightly being able to see what is not good and is not God's plan around us, and it should cause us to mourn, but we mourn as those with hope. Still with me? Verse five, the third and the final beatitude we'll look at today. Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meek is a tough word to define. Um, this is the third time I think I've said this to you guys. Like, I don't think y'all use this word very much. Maybe you do. Try it out with me. I want to hear it. Um, I'm pretty sure, I meant to double check, fact check this. I'm pretty sure this Greek word is used four times total in the New Testament. It's not very common. One time Jesus uses it in a really famous verse where he describes himself this way. Um, he says like, come to me for I am meek or gentle and lowly. So the word meek has a few different definitions, and I want you to try to think about this word for a second. Blessed are the meek are those who are gentle. There's a gentleness, but there's also a self-control element to it. And there's also this kind of third-person thing going on in the word meek. Meekness is an absence of malice or vengefulness. Again, let's think about Jesus who called himself this. I'm gonna confess to you a little bit more about that spectrum I find myself on right here, okay? There are many times where many of these beatitudes are just not what defines and looks like my life when you see me. And then I feel so favored that God at times is working in me and I can see my spiritual bankruptcy. And then praise God, at times I see this bankruptcy and causes me to mourn and grieve for that which is not right inside of me. And then if you come to me and you tell me about my bankruptcy, I get pretty defensive and I start wanting to say some words back at you because it is my lack of meekness inside of me. Jesus is your perfect example of what it means to be meek. Meek would be other people could look at him and rightly or wrongly see him, and still he would not respond with malice or vengefulness, because Jesus was gentle and had self-control. These are words for you and for me. Blessed are you, you are so favored by God when he is working this inside of you. Does this make sense? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, the Jewish people would have heard this, and inherit the earth, maybe your version says inherit the land. They would have heard this, they queue up the promised land in their brain. Think for a second about the promised land. The promised land in the Old Testament for God's people was both a literal place and a figurative place at the same time. So literally, there was an actual geographic area I, uh, on a map between the Mediterranean Sea and this desert, this big rectangle with a little sliver of Canaan right there. There, There's this big literal place that God brings his people into, but also figuratively, God's people knew that what God had for them was something spiritual and eternal more than this life had. He's saying, blessed are you, the meek, 
You're gonna inherit this. I have this place for you. Praise God. There's your Beatitudes. What I see throughout this is really probably my only kind of point or thought I wanted to share with you today is something that has to do with the now and the not yet. I am, I've reflected on how many people's Sundays I've ruined by talking about grammar on a stage because I like talking about grammar and I'm about to do it again. So I wanna ask you in advance to just show me mercy as I talk with you a little bit about some of the tenses that are used in this text, okay, because it matters. We've talked about sandwiches. You remember how Matthew writes, he, he does some of this and then he puts some meat inside of it so you see how it all goes together. He does a lot of this on purpose. He's a really good writer. You with me? In verse three, Jesus begins the Beatitudes, and the first Beatitude, he says, blessed are a group of people, for theirs is, present tense, something. In the last Beatitude, Matthew 5, verse 10, it says, blessed are a group of people, for theirs is something. There's your bookends. But in the middle, there's this whole section of Beatitudes that says, blessed are this group of people, for they shall receive something. Now, these verb tenses are actually really important because they speak to something that I want to ask you to consider today that we're going to get to in just the next couple minutes, which is the difference between things that are right now true and still not yet fully true. This happens throughout Scripture in a bunch of ways. In, in our text, we're going to come back to our text in just a second. Throughout Scripture, we see a theme of things that God has put into place now but is not yet fulfilled. So even if you start in Genesis 1, the Garden of Eden was perfect, but it wasn't yet whole. It wasn't yet everything God had for you. You sang about some of these words this morning. I wrote some of these down because I loved that first song we sang. Today was my first time singing that song uh, that we did to start the morning, and I loved those lyrics. You sang these. You probably said things like, the future grace that is mine now, and then in that chorus, you started singing things like, I'm fighting this battle right now that you've already won, but that's because of something that will happen in the future. We talk about these tenses like this in church, and sometimes we miss what we're actually talking about. There are a few key words I wanna ask you about Christians, again, disciples of Jesus, come in. This one's for you. Take the word adoption for a moment. You know what it means in normal English. You use it all the time. You talk about people who adopt. It's beautiful. Remember for a second that that is your only hope of being a son of the living God or a daughter of the living God is that he would adopt you, right? You're with me? You start in a place separate from him, dead, and then God adopts us. I have a question about how that happens. Can you consider a couple questions for me? Does it happen now or will it happen? What's the, what does the Bible say about your adoption? My, um, my favorite chapter in the Bible is Romans 8. Let's look at Romans 8 real quick. Romans 8, verse 15. Paul says this. Try to, try to look at verbs with me, even if you hate verbs or the fact that I said verb today. Romans 8, verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but, here's in English, you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Most annoying word I'll give you today. This, this have received adoption is a tense you never learned in school because we don't have it in English. It's a Greek tense called the aorist tense. What it means is a past verb that is fully completed. You have, past tense, been adopted. So when are you gonna be adopted? Christians, you say, I have been, maybe. Let's go to chapter eight, verse 23, a few verses later. It says, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, Christians, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, Christians, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly. We are waiting for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. If you're waiting for something, it hasn't yet happened, right? So Christian, tell me about your adoption. It both has happened, follower of Jesus, and you're waiting for it to happen. That's confusing. Sometimes in the South, in our churches, we use the word saved a lot, right? It's a good word and it's fine. It's a biblical word. It's fine to use this word. You've been saved is something we say. I have a question about what it says in the Bible. Let's look at it. My second favorite chapter in the Bible is Ephesians 2. These are just fun facts for you. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. It says, for by grace you, look at the verb, have been saved through faith. It's not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of work so that no one can boast. You have been saved is a perfect participle. I know you hate it, and I'm sorry. The perfect participle means it's a verb that happened before wherever you are right now. That's what it has. It just means that something happened after that's now current. This is before. It's another way in English we just say, okay, past, right? It happened. You have been saved, right? Christian, have you been saved? 
Yes, sort of. Like, let's look back at Romans chapter five, verse nine. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Shall sure seems future, doesn't it? That's because it is, it's a future verb. So Christian, you have been adopted, you will be adopted. You have been saved, you will be saved. You know another churchy word we use a lot? It's sanctification, right? I know you're not saying that often. It's okay if you don't even know what it means. It means being more like Jesus by his spirit. He's making you more like him. When does that happen? Let's see. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, Paul says, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. You have been sanctified. The way it's translated, just with the ED on the end, this is another perfect participle in Greek. It happened in the past. You have been sanctified, Christians. You in Corinth, that's what he's talking to. Like You people in the church right now, you have been sanctified. Is there any hope that you will? What does the Bible say? In 1 Thessalonians chapter five, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do this, this sanctification. Christian, you have been adopted. You will be adopted. You have been saved. You will be saved. You have been sanctified. You will be sanctified. It's a confusing tension, but when I first came to grips with this concept, I was, I was in seminary at the time, and some professors were talking about this, and it helped me to see myself so much better because let me make it personal to you. Will you let me be your friend and still be really honest with you for a second? Listen, Christian, I, right now, have a part of me that longs for greed and covetousness and to have more of that which pleases me. And right now, I have a part of me that desperately longs to be free of that and to not have that define me right now. I, right now, have parts of me that long to use my eyes in ways that would not honor God and to look in ways that will not honor God. And I right now have a part of me that desperately longs just freedom from that and to have eyes that only look to him. I right now have inside of me this longing to be king of my life, lord of my life, fully in control. And there's a part of me right this moment that just desperately longs that Christ would be lord over my life, that my control idols that rule me, that God would free me from them. I am helped by this concept of now and not yet because both of these are me now because I am now adopted, saved, and sanctified and I am not yet fully adopted, saved, and sanctified. Are you with me? Does this, does this help you see yourself? That's who you are, Christian. God has done something, praise the Lord, and he will. Let's come back to our text where we are in Matthew 5 because this right here ought to give you a ton of rest and hope. In verse four, we looked at this already. Christian, this is for you. Take heart. You shall, according to verse four, four, be comforted. There is comfort ahead of you. I'm gonna steal one of John's verses for next week. Verse seven, Christian, find rest and hope. You shall receive mercy. Thank the Lord, right? Verse nine, Christian, you shall be called his sons and daughters, but listen to me closely. Right now, in this moment, there's no longer condemnation for you. So verse four, even though it's a future verb, right now means Christian, take heart. Because right now, you can find comfort. Jesus longs to say, come to my little children. Come and be close to me. I wanna comfort you now. Thank you, Lord. Right now, verse seven, even though it's written in the future, right now, Jesus has a heart to show you mercy now. And look at yourself. Consider life for a second. He has shown you mercy, hasn't he? Praise God for that. Verse nine, yes, it says you shall be called sons and daughters, but right now he looks at you and he says, you are my daughter, my beloved daughter. You are my beloved son right now. Praise God for this now and this not yet that is taking place inside of us at all times. Rest in that love that he has for you. So how do we live as a result of that? This is how we, how we conclude today. We live by considering our posture. When it says, blessed are the poor in spirit who mourn, who are meek, 
we're describing a posture of humility. You, you guys have done what I've done, where you have lived and at times had a posture of pride and a posture of humility, and probably plenty of places in between. Is that, is that true for you too? Um, for me, there are way too many times when it's this side, the pride side. Tim Keller is a really precious, uh, just follower of Jesus, theologian, pastor, who recently passed away, and he, he was fam- one, one, like a famous quote, at least in my life, I don't know if it's famous to you, a famous quote to me was something he said where he said, the gospel, that's like Jesus coming to be able to save you from death to life, the gospel is not just your ABCs, it's your A to Z, it's, it's everything for the Christian life, right? I wanna talk to you, Christians, again, lean in, it's for you. When you came to know Jesus, when he adopted you, what was your posture at the time? At the time, I'll tell you, it it might not have been these words, but your posture was one of just like, God, I need you. I see myself right now and I just need you. Help me, come and be near. I need you, God, right? Wasn't that what was happening inside of you, Christian, when something was beginning to transform? Your posture wasn't one of, I've got it all figured out, look at me. Your posture was very different. That same posture of the gospel is what will sustain your walk with Jesus. A to Z, your walk with Jesus will be sustained by a posture of humility. And here's the problem, is that too many of us, too much of me has the posture of pride. Too much of me is not the poor in spirit who's mourning that and who is meek. Too much of me is chasing after secondary things that will never fulfill me. And in my pride, I am not this group that, that is what Jesus is calling me to be. In, uh, in the book of Luke, there's another record of this exact same sermon. It's in Luke chapter six. And after the Sermon on the Mount's over, you don't have to turn, I'm gonna just tell you a story you've probably heard before. In Luke 15, Jesus tells a parable, a story, about the prodigal son. If you've been around church, you've probably heard this one. I'm gonna just give you a short version of this story because um, this might give you some comfort. In this story, there's a father who has two sons, and the younger of the sons asks his father for his inheritance because He's saying, like, I I don't want to wait any longer. I I want all of what is for me right now. And it's a slap in the face to his father. In that culture in particular, it wouldn't be appropriate right now for you to say that to your parents. But in that time, it is just an unheard of, awful thing that this, this young boy is asking. And he wants this because he has some secondary longings. So so he asks his father, Can I have my inheritance? The father says, Okay, here it is. Go and use this. And the young man goes out and chases after things like a job or career. There's something secondary that might relate to you and me. Chases after pleasures and comforts. That might relate to us. And you probably know the story begins to end by this young man losing all of it. He squanders everything. And then a famine comes in the land and he's hungry. And he comes to the conclusion, I need to go back to my father I need to humble myself before him because I would rather be a servant in his house than out here where I am. And if you're like me, John John just so beautifully last week said this. If you didn't listen last week, go listen to the recording. John just reminded us like the posture of Jesus is one of such great love for you. He's sitting on this mountain to tell you this sermon because he loves you. And sometimes I start to recognize my pride and I wanna go back to Jesus and then I start thinking, I bet Jesus is sitting up there with a little smirk on his face and and my father is just saying, oh, of course, here comes Nick again. I kind of figured he would do that. When it's not at all the correct biblical image of who your father and my father is. In Luke chapter 15, we see the, the plan of the young man. He has a plan to go to his father and say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. He arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, look at this, his father saw him and felt compassion and he ran and embraced him and kissed him and they go and throw this celebration for the father who, for the son who comes back to the father. I share this with you because the A to Z of your Christian life, disciples of Jesus, 
is that throughout, as you and I drift away from this humble spirit, poor in spirit, mourning that meek before those around us, and as we drift into pride and searching these secondary things that will always leave you incomplete and always leave you frustrated, the call is for a posture of humility to run back to the open arms of your Father who longs to run to you and to embrace you, to bring you near, and to be able to show compassion to you as you come to his table. So therein is my call for you, my friends, this week, would be to remember, Jesus says you'd be so fortunate, so, so favored, you would flourish. You're poor in spirit and mourn and meek, but he's not saying you go do these things and save yourself, that's wrong. What he's saying is you can't, I, Jesus, can. I am these things. You come to me, come to me humbly, and I will make you more like me. You who are adopted, I will adopt you. Saved, I will save you. Sanctified, I will sanctify you. Come humbly before me, and I will make you these things. Would you guys pray that same thought with me as you go before him? God, that is our posture right now. It's just hungry and needy. We recognize our bankruptcy. We recognize before you how inept and weak and incapable we are without your help. And so God, our cry in our heart right now is simply this. Father, would you just welcome us back to your table? Welcome us back in your presence, God. We know that you will. And God, that is our heart's longing. God, we, we see who we are. God, let us come and be near to you where we can be able to experience the fullness of your presence. We want to be near to you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. My friends, my prayer for you is that may you go this week and be able to experience, through a posture of humility, experience the great love that your Father has for you. He is a good, good Father. Go and be blessed. Have a great week. Thanks for being here.